Hi everyone, for today's lesson, we are going to be factoring and solving quadratics when a is equal to one. Our learning objective for today is for you to be able to say, I can factor quadratic expressions and I can solve quadratic equations. These are going to be ones where our a value is equal to one and the, the uh, equations that you will see are going to be ones in which they will be written in standard form. Okay, before we get started, let's go ahead and recall some vocabulary words that I know that you learned when you were in Algebra 1. The first vocabulary word is monomial. A monomial is an expression that is a constant number, is a constant, and a constant is simply a number. Or it is an expression that is a variable. Or it is a product, and product means to multiply and multiply. It is a product of these. So examples of monomials would be like the number five, the number pi, the letters x and y, or the expression negative 2x squared. All of these are going to represent monomials. A binomial is simply the sum, sum means to add together, two monomials. So if you add two monomials together, like x plus 5, or 4x squared minus 7x, all of those are considered binomials. A trinomial is the sum of three monomials. So that would be something like x squared minus 7x plus 11, where you're adding three different terms together. And what we're going to do is we are going to be going from factored form to expanded form whenever we are factoring. So technically, these two expressions are equal to each other. So let's go ahead and explore how that's possible. First thing that we're going to do is to go from factored form or intercept form. We call it factored form because it has two parentheses around it. To expanded form means that there's no parentheses. So what we're going to do is we're going to FOIL. First, outside, inside, last with these two parentheses. So I'm going to multiply x times x, and I'm going to come up with x squared. x times 8, which is plus 8x. Negative 7 times x, which is minus 7x. And negative 7 times 8, which is minus 56. I have four terms here. I just want you to keep that in mind. From here, I'm going to combine my like terms, and I end up with x squared plus x minus 56. Do you see how these two expressions are now equivalent to each other? What we are going to do when it comes to factoring is we're going to get an expanded form and we're going to turn it back into factored form. So the way that we're going to do this is we need to, uh, we're going to be doing a couple of approaches um, for us to be factoring backwards. But we know that to go backwards, this is supposed to be two parentheses. And it's all about what did we multiply together to get our first term? What did we multiply together to get our last term? And what happened in between with these two middle terms? So an approach that we typically use is this thing called an X, fact, uh, an X method. I know that my very first term, the only way for me to get an X squared is for me to multiply X times X. So I know that to be true. I just don't know what's going to happen right here. So that's where this x comes in. At the very top of my x, we are going to have a times c. The a and c comes from the fact that this is in standard form, in which my a value is going to be equal to one, my b value is going to be equal to one, and my c value is equal to negative 56. A times C, that's 1 times negative 56, which is negative 56. And what comes down here is my basement. 
So I have to figure out what two numbers multiply together to equal negative 56, but together add to equal my B value. So if we think about that, we think about all of the factors of 56, always go with the ones that are most common. Like when I think of 56, I don't immediately think of 2 times 28. That's not something I think of right away. Instead, I would probably think of 7 and 8. And I know that in order for me to get a 1, I would need 7 to be negative and 8 to be positive. So because a is equal to 1, I am going to simply put minus 7 and plus 8 inside of my parentheses. And there is my factored form. And notice that this minus 7 and this 8 came right here when in our expanded form. And so that's where these, how FOIL and factor are connected to each other whenever we are factoring. So this is the pro process that I just talked about was the reverse. That reverse process of FOIL is called factor. And sometimes trinomials are factorable, sometimes they are not. So that's why I say you can reverse this process and factor if possible. And the trinomials are, I'm sorry, the trinomials in the form of x squared plus bx plus c. So in order to factor ax squared plus bx plus c when a equals 1, when the leading coefficient is 1, you ask yourself, what two values multiply together to equal your c value? Which notice that a times c, if our a value is always 1, it ends up being just c. Yet together add to equal b. That's what you're trying to ask yourself. And we are going to be creating this x to help us. Eventually, I don't want you to be working with this x, and I want you just to be able to do this in your head. But they should together add to equal a times c, and down here would be your b value. And because a is equal to 1, it's just going to be c. All right, let's go ahead and factor these, if possible. So we have x squared minus 3x minus 18. So I'm going to write the structure of my factorization first. I know it's supposed to be two parentheses, and I know that the only way for the first times the first to equal x squared is if I split that x squared apart into an x and an x. And I have to ask myself, what two numbers multiply together to equal negative 18, because that's my c value, and together add to equal negative 3, because that's my b value. So I have to think of all of those factors of 18. And when I think of 18, I think of 1 and 18, 2 and 9, and 3 and 6. So which ones will give me a 3? Probably 3 and 6. So I'm going to put a 3 and a 6 right here. And my goal is to have it add to equal negative 3. So I'm going to make 6 negative because it's the bigger number. And I'm going to verify 3 times negative 6 is negative 18. 3 plus negative 6 is negative 3. So this 3 and negative 6, that's what goes inside of right here. x plus 3 and x minus 6. All right, next I'm going to go ahead and look at letter B. Letter B, I'm going to write down the structure. The only way for me to get a d squared is to split apart that d squared into a d and a d. And I have to ask myself, what two numbers multiply together to equal 48, yet together add to equal 14? So always think of, like, whenever I think of 14, uh, 48, the first thing that comes to my mind is 6 times 8. And I know that 6 times 8 is 48, and 6 plus 8 is equal to 14. So plus 6 and plus 8 is what I would put here. For the next one, I'm not going to do the x, and I'm just going to do it in my head. I'm going to split apart the m squared into an m and an m. So I wrote out the structure, and I have to think of the number negative 63. So when I think of just a plain 63, the first thing that comes to my mind is a 7 and a 9. And so I, I know that I want to have a negative 63, so one of these has to be negative because it has to add to equal 2. I know that positive 7 minus 9, I'm sorry, negative 7 plus 9 is equal to 2. So I need my parentheses to have an m minus 7 and an m plus 9. 
All right, you'll see that this next one says solo. So if you wouldn't mind ha um, working on these individually and having them ready to go for the next time that I see you, that would be wonderful. Let's go ahead and move on. So there exist these factoring patterns and these fac special factoring patterns are something that you will see over and over and over again. And this is something that I absolutely need you guys to know and study. They are not going away and they are time savers. So please make sure that you memorize these factor or these factoring patterns. The first one is called difference of two squares. And in my class, we call that dots. I'm going to say, oh, that's a dots, a difference of two squares, D-O-T-S. And what you're going to see is just a binomial where the first term and the last term are perfect square values. And they are being subtracted from each other. So a squared minus b squared, the pattern for this is that we would have two parentheses just like before, but the first term is going to be the square root of a squared, in which a square and a square root cancel away, leaving us with the letter a. That is my first term. My last term is the square root of b squared. The square and the square root eliminate, leaving me with b. So my last term is going to be b. How do you get a negative? Well, you multiply a positive times a negative, and that is your pattern. A difference of two squares is going to have two parentheses where the first term is the square root of the first term in our binomial. The last term is the square root of the last term of our binomial, and the signs in between are different. So the way that this looks is I'm going to take the square root of x squared, that is equal to x. So I'm going to write down my structure, and my first term is going to be an x. My last term is a 4. The square root of 4 I know is 2, so my last value, or my last term in the parentheses, will be a 2. Now I deal with the minus. The minus. How do you get a minus? Well, that's a positive times a negative. So whenever you see that B value, that is gone. That's what I want you guys to do is recognize that this is a difference of two perfect squares. Now, I want you to please be careful. There exists something called a sum of squares. Sum of squares, I call that an SOS. An SOS means save our ship. Now, let me tell you, if you're putting out an SOS, that's not a good thing. And a sum of squares would look like x squared plus 4. And an x squared plus 4 is not factorable. These are the only ones that are not factorable that I'm going to give you um, where they would, we call it not factorable. We also call it prime. Um, there's nothing you can do with those problems. You cannot factor them at all. So that's called an SOS, a sum of squares. Can't do anything with it. All right, please, please, please make sure that you are keeping your eyes peeled for those types of problems. It's called an SOS is what I call it. The next uh, pattern that we have is called a perfect square trinomial. I call that a PST. A PST, if you can keep your eyes peeled for a PST, this is really, really helpful because it saves you a whole bunch of time. The first term and the last term are going to be perfect squares, just like we saw with dots. But the middle term will be an even number. So you'll see a tri perfect trinomial where the first term and the last term are perfect square numbers and the middle term is an even number. It'll either be plus an even number or it'll be minus an even number. And that even number is two times the square root of your first term and your last term. And the way that this factors is it becomes a plus b times a plus b or in other words, we call that a plus b parentheses squared. Both answers I will accept for full credit. And we have a plus sign in between 
because we have a plus sign in the middle. So all pluses means that we have plus signs in between. And how I got A and B is the same way that I did it up here. I'm gonna take the square root of A squared, which is A, and the square root of B squared, which is B. So that is still gonna be my first and last term. But because my middle term is a plus, we'll have two pluses. And so the way that we look at this is my first term and my last term are perfect square numbers. So I'm gonna take the square root of x squared, which is x, and in my structure, I'll have an x and an x. The square root of nine, I know is three, so I'll have a three and a three, and because my middle term is an even positive number, I'm gonna have a plus and a plus. And notice that it says two ab. Let's think about it. What is two times x times three? Well, two times x is two x, and two x times three, that equals six x. So that is where that even number comes from. It's two times the square root of the first term times the square root of the second term. You can also rewrite this as x plus three squared. For example, number four, same exact idea. The per first term is a perfect square. The last term is a perfect square. So I will have that a an A in my first position and a B and a B in my last position, but because my middle term is a minus, I will have minus signs in between. And this is equivalent to A minus B squared. Let's go ahead and look at our example. The square root of X squared is X. The square root of four is two. So my parentheses is going to have an X and a two and an X and a two. And because my middle term is a minus, both of my parentheses will have a minus in it, and that will be x minus 2 squared. Let's verify that. What is 2 times x times 2? Well, 2 times 2 is 4, and that's 4x. So I end up getting that middle term. The next three problems are solos, where you get an opportunity to practice this idea. And that is something that I would like you to do before I see you next time. Let's go ahead and look at the next type of, pro uh, type of problems. And this is called solving. So before we did factoring, and now we're going to solve quadratic equations by factoring. And solving quadratic equations is this next part of the unit that, um, that we will be focusing on a lot. There are many ways to solve quadratic equations, and one way is by factoring, especially if that quadratic equation is factorable. All quadratic equations must equal zero before you are allowed to solve because to solve equations, you're going to be identifying not just the intercepts because factored form looks just like intercept form, but you're going to be identifying the x-intercepts and the roots and the solutions of our quadratic equations. So that is what these blanks are for. So it says you can use factoring to solve certain quadratic equations. A quadratic equation in one variable can be written in the form of zero equals ax squared plus bx plus c. This is known as standard form, and a is not allowed to equal zero because if a did equal zero, you have a linear and no longer have a quadratic. Notice that this is equal to zero, and that's because we are going to be identifying the x-intercepts of our function. The x-intercepts of our function are where the function, or y, is equal to zero. So the x-intercepts of the quadratic equation are called the roots of the equation. These x-intercepts are not just called roots, they're also known as solutions of the equation, or they're also known as zeros of the function. So you're going to see that language over and over and over again. And I'm here to tell you that the process for identifying x-intercepts or solving equations or finding zeros or looking for the roots of the equation all are asking you to do the exact same thing. You're going to set that equation equal to zero and factor. Now, if the left side of ax squared plus bx equals c can be factored, then the equation can be solved using the zero product property.
property. The zero product property or the ZPP, lots of fun things that I say around here, the ZPP, the zero product property says that if you have two expressions, so notice that we're not dealing with like little a, we're dealing with capital A and they represent like big time expressions like parentheses. If you know that one expression times another expression is equal to zero, then either the first expression is equal to zero or the second expression is equal to zero. So what I mean by expressions is x plus five is considered one expression and x plus two is equal to a second expression. And if these two expressions multiply together to equal zero, then we set our first parenthesis equal to zero and our second parenthesis equal to zero to find our solutions or to find our zeros or to find our x-intercepts or to find our roots. All of those words mean the same thing. We solve for x and we would say the answer is x equals negative five or x equals negative two. So let's go ahead and look and solve this equation. So we're gonna solve x squared minus x minus 42 equals zero. So we're gonna try to see if we can factor the left-hand side using our factoring skills. I know that whenever I, that in order to factor, I know that the structure is going to be two parentheses. Because I'm solving an equation, I must maintain equal zero all the way up until the very end. So I'm gonna split apart the x squared into an x and an x. And I'm going to think about the number negative 42. What two numbers multiply together to equal negative 42, but together add to equal negative 1? So let's go ahead and think about that. When I think of 42, I automatically think of 6 and 7. You could also think of like 3 and 14, but a lot of people don't think of that. A lot of people also don't think of 2 and 21. But 6 and 7 is like those most common numbers. Can I get a negative 1 from 6 and 7? I think so. I can get, make this um, a positive 6 minus 7 is equal to negative 1. So I think that inside of the parentheses, I'm going to need a plus 6 and a minus 7. Cool. Now that I have it in factored form, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set each parenthesis equal to 0. And I'm going to solve for x. I would subtract 6 on both sides, and I would end up with x is equal to negative 6. And I would add seven to both sides to end up with x is equal to seven. So that is the solutions of my equation, x equals six or x is equal to seven. I'm gonna put an or right here because it's either one or the other. And that's what we had. It was a equals zero or b equals zero. Now, you can always check with your graphing calculator because remember, these solutions are your x-intercepts, so you just want to see what those x-intercepts are and verify that you did it correctly. So you would just put this equation into your graphing calculator and locate the x-intercepts, which is also known as zeros. To locate your x-intercepts, you would put your equation into y equals, and then you would press second trace. And then you would go to zeros and you would identify your zeros. Let's go ahead and look at example number four. It says, what are the roots of the equation? Remember, roots, solutions, intercepts, zeros all mean the same thing. But look at this equation. It is not equal to zero. And in order for us to solve anything, it must equal zero. So the first thing I need to do is subtract 35 on both sides so that I can make this equation equal to zero. So I have x squared plus 2x minus 35 equals zero, and I'm gonna try to factor the left-hand side. So I'm gonna split apart the x squared into an x and an x, and I'm gonna ask myself what two numbers multiply together to equal 35 and together add to equal two. And whenever I think of 35, I think of five and seven, and I want a positive 2, so I know I need to go 7 minus 5 to get positive 2. So I'm going to make that a positive 7 and a negative 5, which means that I would set each parenthesis equal to 0. And I would subtract 7 on both sides to get x equals negative 7. Or I would add 5 to both sides to get x equals 5. So these two numbers represent our roots of the equation. 
ahead and look at example number five. We have f squared minus 121 equals zero. Hmm, this one has two terms. And the last time we talked about two terms is up here when we were working with a difference of two squares. So whenever you see two terms, ask yourself, is it a difference of two squares? And in this case, it is. 121 is a perfect square number. So what I'm going to do is say, ho, oh, ho, this is a dot. A difference of two squares. So I'm going to factor this into two parentheses. And I really don't need to show any work. I know that the square root of f squared is f and f. I know that the square root of 121 is 11. And I know that only a positive times a negative is equal to a negative 121. Therefore, here's a shortcut. If you already know what your answers are going to be, you can simply write just below it, f would equal negative 11 or f would equal positive 11 from our parentheses. You can also write this as plus or minus 11 as your answer as well. All right, last idea, and that is that connection once again to the x-intercepts as well as to the fact that we are working in intercept form. So what we are going to talk about in terms of the x-intercepts of y equals a times x minus p and x minus q, remember p and q are the x-intercepts, or actually those are our values that we would put into the ordered pairs of p comma zero and q comma zero. And because the function's value is zero when p is equal to zero and when q is equal to zero, p and q are known as the zeros of the function. All right, let's go ahead and look at finding the zeros for this function. So it says to find the zeros of this function by rewriting the function into intercept form first. So that means basically factored form. All right, let's go ahead and look at this. So the, before finding zeros, in fact, or putting it in factored form, well, the first thing that we would want to do is replace this y with a zero because we want to find what the zeros are. So let's go ahead and write, change this y to a zero and we're going to put our factored form. So I'm going to split apart the x squared into an x and an x and ask myself what two numbers multiply together to equal negative 28 and together add to equal 3. Whenever I think of 28, I always think of 4 and 7 first. I don't really think of 2 and 14 first. Can I get a 3 from a 4 and a 7? Yeah, I can go 7 minus 4. And so therefore, I'm going to have a plus 7 and a minus 4 inside of my parentheses. So therefore, my zeros are going to be, if you want, you can write this as x plus 7 equals 0 and x minus 4 equals 0. So therefore, x equals 7 and x equals um, or negative 7 and x is equal to 4. Or you can just immediately skip down to this step. These are our two solutions. These are our zeros. In terms of x-intercepts, we would write this as negative 7, 0 or 4, 0 if they, the directions asked you to identify the intercepts. So these are zeros. These are intercepts. Let's go ahead and look at letter B. For letter B, the first thing I'm going to do is replace Y with zero. And look what I have here. I have X squared minus four X plus four. My first term is a perfect square. My last term is a perfect square. My middle term is even. This is a PST. There is no real thinking that needs to go along here. So I can break this apart into two parentheses and I know that this is gonna be an X and a two, and because my middle term is a minus, both of them are gonna be minuses. And because both of those parentheses are the same, I already know that my answer is simply going to be the opposite of what I see inside, which is simply x equals two. This is my zero, or my root, or my solution, and my intercept, which in this case is only one intercept, is going to be two zero. Knowing the difference between zero and intercept is going to be really important. Let's go ahead and look at letter C. 
I have f of x is equal to x squared minus 10x plus 25. I'm going to replace f of x with 0 since we're finding the zeros. And oh my goodness, my first term is a perfect square. My last term is a perfect square. My middle term is even. This is again a PST. Woohoo! So I already know how I'm going to factor that. That is going to be um, splitting apart the x squared into an x and an x. I know that the square root of 25 is 5, so I'll put a 5 and a 5, and my middle term is minus. You don't have to write it like this. You can also write this as x minus 5 squared, and that also emphasizes the fact that we really only have one parenthesis, and our answer is going to be x equals 5. This is a 0, and if the directions asked you to find the intercept, 5, 0 would be our x-intercept. And that is the end of today's lesson. If you have any questions over anything that I talked about today, please feel free to email me. Otherwise, I hope you have a wonderful day.